stroke is the uh, you know, varying somewhere between the third and the fifth leading cause of death in the United States, but it is the major cause of disability, costing in the you know, somewhere around the $53 billion a year range. There are over 700, more likely 850,000 strokes. The numbers kind of go up and down uh, 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 depending upon uh, uh, people's diets actually. But the annual stroke rate is about two to 5%. And unfortunately, 30% die, 30% are severely disabled. And the most common etiology for a stroke, 20 to 30% is, is secondary to, to uh, carotid stenosis. And what happens after uh, an embolus flows from the carotid artery up into the internal carotid circulation in the middle cerebral is you get complete occlusion of the middle cerebral and you can either get a, a wet infarct like this where there's a bleed into the uh, ischemic cavity or you can have a dry infarct which eventually becomes a cavity uh, over time in the middle cerebral distribution. I just wanted to remind everybody about the, the origins of the carotid, the right, the right carotid comes off the subclavian, the left comes off the aortic arch, both vertebral arteries come off the subclavian uh, and, and, and go up. The anterior circulation is formed by the carotid arteries with the anterior cerebral and middle cerebral, and then the circle of Willis commu uh, communicating with the posterior circulation and also the anterior communicating artery. <clears throat> And many of you know that the, the most common location for a stroke is going to be in the middle cerebral distribution. These, uh, this is a figure demonstrating the vascular supply to different regions of the brain. Obviously, the middle cerebral artery supplies, as you see here, the frontal and temporal uh, portions. The posterior cerebral artery supplies the inferior temporal lobe via the posterior uh, temporal branch and also the occipital uh, branches. The anterior cerebral supplies the medial portions of the uh, frontal lobes back to the <clears throat> parietal lobe. And don't forget about the anterior choroidal artery, which you know, I always use the mnemonic as one of my PIM questions is what does it supply? It's, it's PLOAC, it's P-L-O-A-C. So it's the posterior limb of the internal capsule, which is motor, optic radiations, amygdala, uh, uh, lentiform nuclei and choroid plexus. So very important structures supplied by the anterior choroidal if you have an embolic event in those areas. What is going on in the process of atheromatous disease <clears throat> is there's lipid deposition predominantly within the tunica media. And with that lip lipid deposition, there can also be adhesions of platelets forming a mural thrombus. And as a result of the mural thrombus, you can either have embolic events, which go distally, or you can end up getting complete occlusive disease. And with the occlusive disease, you can also rarely have a distal emboli from uh, the uh, thrombus that forms within the internal carotid artery. <clears throat> the most common regions for atheromatous and then mural thrombi is going to be in the common carotid artery uh, right at the bifurcation forming the internal carotid artery and the external carotid artery. Another common area is in the vertebral basilar confluence and at the basilar apex. <clears throat> You'll all remember Moya Moya. Uh, we, we do see disease in the cavernous segment and the proximal internal carotid, internal carotid wall. This is what you see looking at a vessel in a, in a patient that has severe atherosclerotic disease. And when you look at the wall, you see that the, the internal elastic membrane uh, with the uh, 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 formation of a thrombus actually stays intact. But the, with the atheromatous disease, you get lipid deposition uh, 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 within the uh, myointima, the adventitia, the third layer of the vessel, uh, stays relatively intact. <clears throat> an embolus, this is an example of an embolus in a distal uh, vessel, the superficial temporal artery. And again, you can see that the basement membrane here remains relatively intact. Uh, this is an acute episode. So the intima, excuse me, the media, 
the, the muscular component uh, doesn't have uh, lipid deposition in it and you don't see swelling of the cells and the adventitia tissue appears to be relatively intact. After an infarct, there's the acute occlusion, there's the uh, swelling of the neurons, the dissolution of the nucleus where you see the, the nissel substance break up, you see the nucleolus shrink, uh, and, and eventually uh, the, the, you know, the, the caspate system and secondary injury starts. And after that, within about 12 hours, you start to see the infiltration of neutrophils. And sometime thereafter, you start to see the uh, infiltration of macrophages to clear out all the debris and, and, and dead cells. I just want to remind you all that when a patient presents with a stroke, I mean, the first thing we, we think about is not necessarily carotid occlusive disease. You've got to start thinking about the origin. And so you worry about the heart. So the patient has to get an ultrasound of the heart and a Holter monitor to make sure that there's no irregularity. Uh, atrial fibrillation is obviously a common source of mural thrombi in the atria, and uh, then distal embolization, uh, uh, the, the, hence getting the, the uh, echocardiogram. You always get a, an ultrasound of the carotid arteries, and then you want to look at the cerebral vessels. But then one has to think about you know, congenital uh, problems. Could a person have moya moya disease? Could a person have Takayasu's disease or some inflammatory process, some autoimmune process? Uh, you know, so you have, to, you have to maintain an open mind and have a relatively broad differential diagnosis, certainly when it comes to taking the boards uh, and or making rounds on the service. You know, it's, it's always good to go through, you know, was there a history of trauma? Was there a dissection that led to a mural thrombus and then distal embolus? Is there a congenital problem? Is there an autoimmune disease? Is there, a, is there a cancer? There are certain cancers that are associated with hypercoagulable states. So learn how to think generally and then apply it specifically to the disease process uh, that we're talking about. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.